Hi, everybody, and welcome to our YouTube channel. This is Arkady Freckman. I'm a New York City personal injury trial attorney. And welcome to Last Week Tonight Live. We are here live. It's 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here in New York City. I'm in my Brooklyn office, and I'm here taking your questions live. So let's see if anyone has any questions. Like, feel free to drop them in the chat. You could drop the live chat. I'm happy to answer, interact with you. You know, I want to be a resource. Our goal is helping serious injury victims and families. So we are here for you. So let's see um, what questions we have, maybe some of the questions that are in our channel, some of the questions that have been here before um, in our comments. That way we can answer some of those, you know, get, get started uh, and give someone a chance to, um, to answer us. Um, oh, I see someone, Suzette Laws says, hi, yes, hello, how are you? Uh, thank you for watching, thank you for watching us. Let's see, um, let me grab the, uh, the comments right now. I just had them, oh, here they are. Okay, these are the comments. So let's start out with some of these comments. So one comment here, sorry, I just like the screen is not letting me open up the comments in a different screen. I'm trying to find it here. Let me, let me try it another way. Uh, just kind of go into another tab and open up the comments here. Oh, here it is. Okay. It's just loading up. Yeah. So the, so the comments, um, when we go to the comments, we see that people have a bunch of questions. No, the number one comment or the most recent comment is, this is fired up. Thank you for your team's commitment. And that's from a Mr. Harrier. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for watching. That's a long time viewer. So thank you for watching. Thank you for interacting. And um, oh, here's a, here's a live question from Gary Wilson. It says, can you talk about the accident when a state police hits you at very high speed and you're injured? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It really depends on how it happens. If the state police hits you and it is, let's say, an accident, meaning, you know, the state police, for whatever reason, they're, they're chasing someone else, they're just negligent, they're reckless, they hit you, then, um, and you're injured, depending on the severity of the injury, it would be a lawsuit against the state police department, against the state. When you're suing the state, it could be the court of claims. So there's no jury in the court of claims. That's a downside. But it sounds like it's a pretty good case, uh, you know, if the if the state police is negligent and they're at fault. So I need to know more facts. Now, there is a, one thing where the state police, if they're, um, you know, have their lights and sirens on and they're in pursuit, then the law basically says that they do have the right to you know, do certain things that a normal driver wouldn't be allowed to do. For example, run a red light. They could do that, but they can't just like close their eyes and run a red light, right? What they have to do is they have to slow down. They have to make sure it's safe. They have to uh, check the intersection. And then if it is safe, then they can go through. So they have that ability, but it doesn't mean that they could be reckless. But when they do have their lights and sirens on, then, in order to recover against, let's say, the police, whether it's state, city, any police, you would have to show that they were reckless. So it's a higher standard, kind of like negligence is the failure to use reasonable care. And reckless is kind of like you don't care about people's safety. So it's a little harder to prove recklessness than it is to prove negligence. So some lawyers are afraid. But, you know, I'm not really afraid of that. I think that you can prove recklessness. It's more of like a disregard for safety and it's almost like uh, knowing that a crash is likely to happen, but doing it anyway. So I think you could definitely prove recklessness and that's only if they have their lights and sirens. If they don't have their lights and sirens on, then it's, re then it's a regular case, right? Just like any other case. And it doesn't matter that they're the police. It could be, you know, Uncle Joe or whatever. It doesn't matter. Oh yeah, it says here, they were not responding to an emergency. So what might be the settlement value? What is the insurance limit? So there's no insurance limit if it's the state, the city, there's no limit. So it's unlimited. It could be you know, millions and millions of dollars. So that's a good thing. 
the the value doesn't depend on the way the incident happened. The value depends on the damages. So depending on what your injuries are, like if you have a surgery to the back or a brain injury, it could be millions and millions of dollars. If you have a little, you know, black and blue spot, everything went away, then it's maybe a thousand. You know what I mean? I can't tell you the value based on how the incident happened. I would need to know. I would need to look at your medical records and speak with you. But you could always text me, 347-566-9595. You know, text me. I've actually done a lot of consultations this week. A lot of people were calling me, texting me, and a lot of really interesting cases. Um, I talked to a gentleman who had a, a trucking crash case, and there was another case with, uh, you know, a lot of different uh, cases. One case was like a trip and fall inside a building due to a rug. Uh, there was a lady who had a, a ceiling uh, issue, a ceiling collapse. So there's a lot of different, you know, different cases. So I, I'm happy to give people consultations. Now, some of the people, they needed a lawyer. So I was like, look, if you need a lawyer and it's a case that I can help you with, it's a serious injury and a case of real merit, then I could be your lawyer. Uh, maybe, you know, you need a lawyer, but it's not in New York. Maybe it's in Michigan or California or wherever. So I know some people that are really, really good trial lawyers, so I could recommend someone to you. Or maybe, you know, you're happy with, you. maybe you have a lawyer. Maybe you, you don't even need a lawyer. You just want to, you know, have a consultation. So I'll try to make myself as available as I can. I'm also busy because I have another trial coming up. It's also a, a fusion, spinal fusion trial uh, in October. So I'm preparing for that. And I have a lot of other work, but I try to make myself as available as I can. Okay, let's see what other questions we have. Um, oh, here, a question from Suzette Laws. Can you appeal a personal injury case? Yes, you can. Appeal just basically means that you're appealing the decision. So you're appealing something, right? You have to appeal either a court order or a decision by the judge. And an appeal usually means that the judge, the trial judge, if you had a trial, or if it was a motion, you know, then it's the motion decision, but it's still the trial judge who decides the motion. So basically you're saying that the judge did something wrong. They didn't follow the law properly. And so then you have the appellate division, which is a group of judges, let's say like five or six judges, they take the case, they review everything, they read the records. So if it's a motion, they'll read the motion papers, all the exhibits. If it's a trial, they'll read the trial transcript that the you know court reporter takes notes, they'll read the whole transcript. And then they'll make a decision as to whether or not that judge did everything by the law. And if the judge didn't, if the judge, if he or she, you know, broke the law, did, didn't do something properly or didn't understand a certain precedent, then they could say, you know, as to this issue, you get a new trial. Or they could say, you know what, the amount is so high, it should be lower. Or they could say the opposite. The amount is too low or the, the jury allowed for zero, but it really should be a million dollars, right? They can do whatever they want. So. So that, that, that is something that happens to our appeals. And then I got mode has a question. Oh, he's asking about a specific law firm. Oh, P Parisman Law Firm. Yeah, I've heard of them. I think they're, they're a pretty good law firm. But yeah, like, you know, if you're asking about specific law firms or specific cases, better to text me because that's something that we should probably discuss privately. But yeah, absolutely. Feel free to text me 347-566. 9595. I'm happy to discuss it with that with you about, about a law firm or about you know specific questions you have. Uh, okay. And then Achille Breeze says, what do you have to prove in a slip and fall on construction site on construction debris? Yeah, so you basically just have to prove, you know, you have to prove that the construction debris was unsafe, that it wasn't a reasonably safe condition, right? That it was something that shouldn't be there, that it wasn't, basically negligence is not doing what you're supposed to do, not using reasonable care. So if you say like, what would a reasonable person do? So let's take a reasonable person. Let's call her Rhea, Rhea Pearson. Rhea Pearson is a reasonable person, right? So let's say Rhea opens up a construction site. Should she leave debris in a walkway? Well, no, right? Because if you leave debris in a walkway, Maybe a construction worker is carrying two by fours or carrying steel rebars. He can't look down at his feet. Now there's construction stone debris. He trips, he falls, he hurts himself. He, he fractures his shoulder, fractures his, injures his knee, needs surgery. That's a violation, right? So that's negligence. Now, with respect to construction, in addition to regular negligence principles, which are codified in the common law, 
There's also the labor law. So there's actually a, a section 30, uh, section 23, and it's known as 241.6, and there's a specific violation, and it's known as the housekeeping violation. So basically, if it is a passageway or a walkway, you can't have construction debris there. Every trade is responsible for cleaning up, but ultimately, the general contractor and the owner of the construction site are responsible, and they can't delegate, meaning they can't say, it's not my fault, it's really someone else's fault, right? They can't pass the buck. It's a non-delegable duty. They're responsible. And so you can use that Title 23 uh, industrial code violation under the 241.6 statute of the labor law, and then you could hold them liable. So I've done a lot of those cases, actually, debris in a, in a passageway. As long as it's in a passageway or a walkway where construction workers you know, go back and forth, I've won those cases, and I've done really well with them. I've uh, you know, I had one that actually went for a, a close to a million dollars, and uh, another one I think went for like eight hundred and fifty thousand. Those are really good cases, as long as the injury is serious. Construction cases are actually some of the best cases because they're just really, really strong. And the, the good, the thing I like about construction cases is that you can tell the human story, right? You can talk about all of the injuries, the injury to the construction worker, the pain and suffering, the injury to the family. A lot of construction workers will have a wife, have kids, right? So the injury to the family. But you could also talk about the future medical expenses because it's so expensive, you know, and you're going you're to need, like, say, future uh, spinal fusion surgery. Just one surgery could be over $100,000. And you could talk about lost wages. So, like, if the construction incident happened a year ago, you have a year of lost salary, plus the union benefits, plus the fringe benefits, plus the overtime. So you have an economist calculate all that. That could be a huge amount. That could be just in one year, it could be like over 100,000, right? All of those benefits plus salary, plus the future. If it's a serious injury, a life-changing forever injury, and that construction worker can't work into the future, well, now you have maybe 20 years, 30 years, and each year, it's 100,000 plus inflation, it's all rising. So you get an economist to calculate all that together with doctors who talk about, you know, and that could be like $5 million, $10 million, just the economic loss. But remember, you're entitled to economic loss, which is the medical expenses plus the lost wages, lost salary, plus you're entitled to non-economic loss, which is the pain and suffering, the loss of enjoyment of life. So you're entitled to both. Now you have like 5 million for pain and suffering, 5 million for economic, boom, we have like a $10 million case. Those are absolute like monster cases. So if anyone needs a consultation about construction, you know, I'm happy to do it. I do a lot of construction cases and I really like those cases. They, they were very good cases. And I feel like a lot of times I hear about settlements and construction cases and a lot of firms undercut them. They say, hey, it's only worth like $1 million. Like this week, somebody texted me and they're saying, hey, my case is only worth like, my lawyer said it's only worth like a million or two. And I looked at that case, all those injuries and he can't go back to work. That's not, I think that's worth a lot more. I think it could be worth seven or even 10. So I think we have to really take those cases to trial and not try to short sell them. A lot of lawyers might think, well, you know what? They're offering me $2 million, So how could I say no to $2 million, right? My legal fee will be $700,000. I'll be rich. Why don't I just take it and go golfing? You know, it's easy. But I don't, I, I'm not like that. I, I think you have to do what's best for the client. And if, it's, if they're offering you two, but it's worth seven, you can't take two. You have to go for it and get the seven or whatever it's worth. Okay, let's see what other questions we have. Here's a question from Payne. Torn Achilles tendon without surgery in New York. $1 million policy with excess umbrella by not having surgery. Will that decrease the value? And how much do you think that's worth? Yeah, I mean, a torn Achilles is a serious injury. It's very, very painful. I don't know if everyone heard, but I think the quarterback, the Aaron Rodgers for the Jets just had a torn Achilles. That was in a football game, so he can't sue but um, it's a very painful injury. You don't always have surgery for it. I suppose if the doctor said that you need surgery, right? Now you have medical advice, like your doctor, the treating doctor said you need surgery and that's documented in the hospital records or in the medical records. And then you still said, you know what? I'm not gonna listen to you. I'm not gonna do it. Then that's known as failing to lessen or mitigate your damages. So that may decrease the value. But if the doctor didn't say you need surgery, or that you could have it versus you could not have it, then you're fine, right? Because then you then it, then it won't lower your damages. You never really want to have surgery unless you have to. Surgery is always a painful thing. 
So it's a million dollar policy with excess. So depending on how much excess they have, but you know, it's hard for me to say exactly the value. From what I've seen, torn Achilles, I had one case with the torn Achilles where a gentleman was running and he was running because he was a maintenance man for a building in Brooklyn. And so he was running because they said there was something going on, some kind of emergency, like a fire somewhere. So he was running to put out the fire. And as he was running, there was like one of those sprinkler heads, you know, to water the grass. And one of them was broken and he tripped over it and he had a torn Achilles. And I believe he did have surgery. And so we tried that case and they said, look, he was running. He wasn't looking where he was going. It was his fault. We said, no, well, he's working. And they said it's an emergency. It's a fire. He's running to put out the fire. He's like a good worker. So we got 100% liability, um, 100% liability against the defendant. And then I believe the verdict was about 750000 in that case. That was a jury verdict in Brooklyn. But that was many years ago. That was like eight or nine years ago. So it's hard for me to say like, you know, now what it's worth. I really have to look at your file because remember, you have the economic damages, whether you have lost wages or not. You have the pain and suffering, past and future. You have medical expenses, past and future, right? So I don't know what your medical expenses are. I don't know if you have lost wages or not. That's why I can't tell you, you know, the exact value. But if I looked at the file in depth, then I would be able to tell you. I think I would be able to tell. So yeah, feel free to text me, 347-566-9595. But I'm sorry you had that. That's a serious uh, injury. And then Zero Gravity Athletics says, slap tear surgery is pending. A city transit bus rolled into the intersection hitting four cars including myself, they accepted liability. What if the potential timeline for settlement and for trial, potential price range? Mm -hmm. So I've been out of work for six months, took place in January. Yeah, I mean, look, a slap tear surgery is pretty serious. I've seen those go for anywhere from, you know, 200,000 up to 500,000 and up, even like 650. So that could, that could be a few hundred thousand. City transit bus, uh, depending on which county you're in, you know, like Bronx is better than like Manhattan or Queens, but Bronx and Brooklyn are the two best, I would say. Manhattan and Queens probably, Staten Island probably the, the worst, but Staten Island's still okay. Um, you know, it depends where it is. It sounds like if the bus rolled into the intersection, it's the bus's fault, hitting four cars, including you. So that's good. You have you, plus you have all these other cars, right? They're witnesses. That you, that you you guys didn't do anything wrong. Timeline, it's hard for me to say. You know, it depends on if you looked at my video, um, how long versus how much. I talked about it depends on how your lawyer prosecutes the case, right? Like for example, you file a lawsuit. Thirty days later, you get an appearance from the other side. If you file a bill of particulars within a week and then say, look, here are my witnesses, here are my injuries, here's what you did wrong. Let's schedule depositions. The court order gives you a deposition in like two three months. You're ready on that date. You're ready to go. The defendant says, let's adjourn. Okay, let's adjourn for two weeks. One time courtesy, no more adjournments. You try to adjourn a second time. I'm going to file a motion. I'm going to strike your answer. I'm going to compel you. I'm going to seek sanctions against you. Now you're aggressive, right? You're moving the case. If a lawyer does the opposite, if a lawyer is like, well, I filed a lawsuit. I got an answer. They appeared, but it's going to sit in my office for six months. I'm not really going to do anything. Oh, the deposition date came and went. Let's adjourn it a fourth time, a fifth time. You know, it could take years, right? So it just depends on how aggressive the lawyer is and how you know diligently they're going to prosecute the case. But generally, if you're asking like generally, I would say a city case can take like about a year or two in discovery. And then maybe if you put it on the trial calendar, it depends on um, you know which venue you're in. But most venues are about a, another year or two waiting on the trial calendar for trial. But it could settle at any time, right? So if it's just a like a slap tear surgery, probably it should settle. But if you end up needing something else, now you have a major injury. If they're not willing to pay you enough, then perhaps you need you need to go to trial. But uh, yeah, so it's kind of, but yeah, feel free to text me also, 347-566-9595. Happy to give you a personal consult. It's always better to give a personal consult than a um, generic you know, comment, even if I'm live, <laughs> I'm happy to do it, but I just need more info. It's better if we talk. Okay. And then let's see who else. Nate the Great says, I have a construction case. Thanks again for answering my questions along the way. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I think that this particular gentleman asked really insightful questions. He was asking about causation, whether that should go on the jury verdict form. 
And, you know, sometimes it does go on, meaning proximate cause or legal cause, whether, um, you know, if you're doing a damages only trial and liability has been admitted, now does the judge have to put the issue of did the defendant, did the person you're suing cause your injuries, right? Did it cause the causation issue? So I've seen it both ways. Like, for example, the last video I did was about, it wasn't my case, it was just a case that I read in a blog, but it actually lost on that question because they asked, well, did the car crash cause your injuries? And the juror said no, because the guy was like, he didn't go to the hospital, although he took his daughter to the hospital, he was sitting right outside the hospital. It was a little tender bender, there was no damage, and then he ends up getting a fusion, plus he had a lawsuit before, so they said he was like an opportunist. You know, you could watch that video for all the details. But they asked that question, even though the defendant admitted they were at fault. They said, yeah, I'm at, I'm at fault. Um, you know, I fought for like, you know, hitting you in the rear, not at fault for causing your injury. I don't know if I caused your injuries, right? I'm just a, I'm just a guy who's driving a car. How would I know if, 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 you know, me tapping you with my car caused your injuries or maybe your injuries were already there from before? So that's more of a medical issue, a question. But other trials, like the trial I did myself in February of 2023, was a girl who cut her leg on a jagged metal pipe. And there, the defendants admitted liability. And I actually argued to the jury. I said, admitting liability means two things. Number one, it means that you were negligent and you didn't use reasonable care. But number two, it also means that you caused the injury. And there, the judge agreed. And she said, yeah, well, what else could have caused it? It's a scar, right? The scar came from the metal pipe. So she didn't have a scar before. She was a 12-year-old girl. What else could have caused it? It's like as a matter of law. So the only question is how much for the past, how much for the future, you see? So just, I guess it depends on the facts and circumstances, but I'd like to do a deeper dive into that. That's a really good question. Okay, and then um, I God Mode says, question, I've been asking my lawyer for six years the value of my case, and he always dodges the question and says it's a lot. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, look, look some lawyers don't want to tell you because they might feel that, you know, if they tell you, hey, it's worth like three million. Well, then if what if they don't get three million? Now they're, you know, now they're going to feel bad or you're going to be mad at them. So, you know, so that's an issue. But it just depends on the lawyer. I, I don't like to say what a case is worth exactly, but I could give you ranges based on what I've seen in my experience. I'm happy to do that. Um, so it just depends on the lawyer. But six years is a long time. And hopefully it's coming up for trial. But if you have any any questions, you know, feel free to text me. And then someone says, can attending school be considered employment and claiming lost wages? No, lost wages would be if you're working and if you're making money, the actual salary. But attending school, you know, if you, there is a, something you can do if you're attending school for a profession. For example, I had a client who was studying to be an accountant. And then, you know, because of the uh, car crash, he couldn't go to school anyway. He couldn't write because he broke his arm. He couldn't write, so he couldn't go to school. So, it's, it's known as lost opportunity. So now he couldn't become an accountant. So instead of becoming an accountant and making a certain amount of money uh, per year, he was working like a, something else, like an Uber driver. So we actually recovered. The jury actually allowed for, I think, something like a hundred something thousand just for that, just for that economic loss. That was only like a year or two. It's, it's known as lost opportunity of future uh, employment. So, and it's actually, you know, you can't, it can't be speculative, meaning you can't guess if you have to have some kind of validity as to some kind of likelihood that you're, that you really would have been that, you know, uh, but for, from what I read, it's right in the pattern jury instruction. So the judge could charge it. The judge could charge the jury, meaning the judge could read that to the jury and the jury will make a decision based on that. So it's right in the pattern jury instruction. So yeah, it's pretty easy to use. Okay. And Leonardo Cuevas says, hi. Oh, yes. Hi. That's somebody who's a new client. So I've been speaking with him a lot. He actually had an interesting uh, case. I mean, I don't want to go into the details, but that's an example of sometimes people don't know what you don't know, right? You, you don't, Like the person thought they had a case that was a good case. That the lawyer was like on top of everything. And then when I started looking at the file, there's all these red flags about what a prior lawyer may or may not do. Like they, you know, could for example, sit on the case, not uh, move the case in the proper way, not file a summary judgment motion, not prosecute it, um, also charge the client, like a lot of fees that shouldn't be charged. Like some lawyers are charging no-fault fees. Like what's a no-fault fee? It's like nonsense. 
are charging. This other person told me, it wasn't this one, but another person this week told me a lawyer was charging him 20% for property damage. Like property damage, like why would you charge money for that? The lawyer doesn't do anything. The adjuster from the insurance company literally goes out, looks at the car, and then says the car is damaged. This is, you know, $5,000, sends a $5,000 check. Now they have to send it to the lawyer because the client is represented, but the lawyer should just give the check to the client. Some lawyers are taking 20% for themselves. I don't do that. I, I don't charge anything. I think it's just, you know, a bunch of crooks, if you ask me. It's not right, but it's happening. And then also charging for like narrative reports, you know, like medical records should be either standard charge. There's actually a, a law that like a high tech law that you could, you could charge something like six dollars is the maximum. If you ask for an electronic copy, it's a federal law. But these guys are charging like five hundred dollar narrative reports. And they're not like narrative reports from a neurosurgeon where the neurosurgeon is sitting there and you know typing a narrative report. OK, that could cost even a thousand dollars or more. But these are like narrative reports from chiropractors. They're just like charging, upcharging in order to put, put more money in their pocket or maybe because they're referring the case to the lawyer or the lawyer's illegally paying the, the medical facility. It's just a bunch of like, you know, it's like a big nest of uh, corruption. It's terrible. So I just hate when people get, you know, screwed over like that. So I like to help people. So I'm helping this particular gentleman, but he has a, a good case. So thank you and hello to you. And, uh, we're going we're gonna to get justice for him. Okay, and then iTech says, hello, I had a discectomy, lower back, and right knee arthroscopic surgery. How much do you think my case is worth if I got rear-ended? Yeah, I mean, a discectomy in the lower back, I've settled for like over 500,000. Right knee arthroscopic, I've settled anywhere from 100 up to also like, I think the highest I ever got was like 800. So if you put both of them together, I mean, 500 plus 800, that's like what, 1.3? But that's the highest, you know? And then perhaps maybe somewhere in the hundreds of thousands for sure. And then Enrique Simo says, two metacarpal, trip and fall in a Bronx park, broken steps and no handrail. It's been six years and five months, my second settlement conference. Okay, yeah, so two metacarpal, I don't know if that's two metacarpal fractures. That could be, I mean, metacarpals are the bones that are after your fingers, right? So the fingers are the phalanges and then like here are the metacarpals, right? And the same thing with your foot, like the toes are the, the toes and then right past the toes are the metacarpals. So metacarpal fractures usually heal pretty well. Usually they don't need surgery unless there's like non-union. So they do have value, but it's not that high. It's usually like, you know, like 30,000, 50,000, 70,000, something like that. Trip and fall in a park, uh, broken steps. If it's broken steps, that's pretty strong. Depends on what kind of park. If it's a city park, you probably need some kind of uh, notice and it could be long against the city. Uh, no handrails. You'd need an expert for that, an engineer. So it's been six years and five months. That's a long time, but you have a settlement conference. So yeah, I would have your lawyer try to like settle it. Um, see what they see what they think it's worth. See what they could get you. If they can't settle it, you know, take it to take it to trial. But depending on the severity of the injury, uh, it could be worth more. You know, I, again, I can't really tell you without looking at the medical records and without speaking. With you. Okay, and then Gary again says, does a higher insurance coverage mean higher settlement? I mean, yeah, usually it does, but not in all cases. Like if you have more insurance, that means you have the possibility to get the big number, right? If you don't have the insurance, like unfortunately, sometimes there could be like a brain injury or there could be a spinal fusion or there could even be a death, but the policy limits are 25,000, right? So you're limited to the policy limits unless, you know, a person who's driving the car has some kind of assets, like owns a house or is just wealthy and has like millions of dollars in the bank. But if that was true, they probably wouldn't get a $25,000 policy, right? That's the minimum, the very, very minimum. So then you're limited by, by that. You're limited by the policy. Now, if it's a big policy, like a $10 million policy, well, of course, you could get $10 million. doesn't mean you will. You know, you could go to trial and get less. The jury could say, this isn't worth $10 million. This is worth $500,000. But you definitely have that potential there. So that's always good. Okay, that was... Uh, and then, let me see. Oh, Enrique says, how much do you think that's worth? Yeah, I think I kind of answered that about the metacarpal. I need to know more about the, the injury. And then he says uh, he won two appeals. Oh, congratulations. That's good. That's good. That, oh, maybe that's why it's taking six years. That six years is a long time. But good luck to you. Try to get it settled. You know, if you have any questions, just text me the 347-566-9595. Then Zero Gravity Athletics says, thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. 
And Payne says, this is a premises liability case versus a fitness gym. I've been out of work for six months. The gym fixed the defective area four months after my injury. I have pictures and videos before and after they fixed the defective area. I also have an ambulance report. Yeah, that's that's really good. I mean, whenever you have evidence, that's good. Whatever they did after the injury is already over, you know, you usually can't use that at trial because that's known as a subsequent remedial measure, right? So the, the theory behind that is that, look, if we were allowed to bring into evidence when people fixed things that they did wrong, like after people got hurt, well, then nobody would fix anything, right? You go, I don't want to wanna fix a, a hole because if I fix it, they're going to come to court and say, look, they fixed the hole. So, that, so, so you can't really use that so much to prove that they were at fault because it was after. But whatever you have before you got hurt, you know, notice uh, that that's powerful. You could definitely use that. Okay, let's see what else. Zero Gravity says, been watching you since the accident and will definitely take an opportunity to give you a call and text. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And then he says, or she, I'm not sure who it is, but it says, uh, lastly, I asked the same question to my lawyer, value of the case. The bus policy is 5 million. How would you approach it? Yeah, I mean, look, I would just build it up. Like I was saying earlier, I would build it up from all angles, from your injury, you know, whatever's bothering you, just see a doctor and get that treated. Um, do whatever the doctor thinks is necessary. So if you have like a back injury, you could see doctors, specialists for that. If you have a, like, a, you know, whatever, whatever's bothering you, whatever your symptoms are, see the best doctors, get the best medical care. And I would also like, you know, approach it from the human story, meaning what's your biography? What's your story? Uh, are you overcoming any obstacles in your life? I mean, this is obviously an obstacle. The injury is an obstacle. But what else? Like your human story, that's really powerful. Because look, every, anybody can come to court and say, like, I have a herniation at L5S1. A juror, right, is just a person who gets a summons for jury duty. They don't even want to be there. They don't know what a herniation is. They don't know what L5S1 is. It's very boring to them. And if someone just goes in there and, and complains and says, I can't sit for too long, I can't stand for too long, I'm like, okay, who cares? But if you tell a story, well, that's powerful, right? Something interesting, like a vignette, like a snapshot, almost like a movie, right? Tell them a story. Uh, so I think that's very important. So what I like to do is I like to interview my clients, go to their home, find out about them, who they are as people, interview them, interview their family members, interview their friends. I create a whole circle of friends, almost like a mind map, like a whole circle of friends, right? Who are your coworkers? Who are your work life? How about your family, your kids, your wife, or your girlfriend, your boyfriend, you know, your whole family? Then maybe you do something like you play a sport. How about all the people from that sport, like baseball, baseball teammates, right? Or something else. Maybe you like to go out, uh, restaurants, you're a foodie. Well, who do you go to restaurants with, right? All those friends. And then you have like different people and people come into court and these people have no skin in the game. They could be your neighbors, your coworkers, and they each tell a story and the story is like five minutes, 10 minutes, and they're done. They're, they, they, they tell that story and they leave because it can't be what's known as cumulative. You're not allowed to say the same thing from different witnesses, how you're saying the same thing. So you, you tell different stories, different aspects of how a person was affected. But what you're really showing is the way a person's life has changed and the fact that this is a serious, permanent, forever injury. That's what you want to convey, right? That's what you want to convey to the jury. And then all of a sudden the jury's like, well, wait a minute. Why would all these people from all the person's life be coming here and talking about all this if it wasn't true? Like, you know, they have no skin in the game. They're just like a neighbor, a postal worker, a dry cleaner, or whoever, whoever you can find, you know. But you got to start early. It takes a lot of prep. And most people don't do that, right? Most people just have the plaintiff, the injured person, come to court and just whine. And people don't like that. Nobody likes a whiner, right? <laughs> so, I mean, do you guys like whiners? I don't think I don't think so. So it really, it really works. That's what I that's what I recommend. Okay. And then Bothrops Trop says, Good day, Mr. Arcady. You guys are taking my case and I have my EBT next month. Do you have any videos talking about EBTs? Gracias, Mr. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, text me because I don't know who that is. I don't know from the username. But um, yeah, three four seven five six six nine five nine five. I did a video. I don't know if it was posted yet. I recorded a video about depositions. I think it was fairly recent, like in the last few weeks. But I'll also, you know, prep you personally one on one. I like to usually, if it's a serious case, schedule at least two 
preps, maybe two to three preps before the deposition. Um, I have a whole memo also, like a written memo, uh, but there's a lot of information out there about depositions, so I'm happy to get into that. And then Jamie Flores says, how much is my case worth? Yeah, I mean, like, again, like I really, that's a question you should ask your lawyer because it's best to like really look at all the evidence, you know, I couldn't really tell you. I think this is somebody that I talked to before, maybe somebody who called me or we had a few consults. And from what I recall, it was a very serious injury. So it should be worth a lot. Like you know, that, that particular case, if it's the one I'm remembering, should be worth a significant amount. But I can't really, I mean, look, you, you should really make an appointment, sit down face to face with your lawyer and, you know, and have them give you that consultation. Okay, and then Nate the Great says, how can I find where we are on the trial calendar? What info do I need to research it? Yeah, I and mean, that's a good question. Like you don't really need any info. What you do is just put in your name. There's, there are websites like eLaw, you put in your name and it should tell you if the note of issue was filed, that means you're on the trial calendar. If the note of issue was not filed, you're not on the trial calendar. So they'll give you a calendar number. If the note of issue was filed, you'll have a calendar number there. So that, and then they'll have what's known as a standards and goals date. And that's the date that the court system sets and the court wants the case to be over by that date. So if you're in like Brooklyn, if you're in uh, Queens, for the most part, they follow the standards and goals date. In fact, in Brooklyn, what they say is if you're within two weeks of the standards and goals date, you're gonna have to either go out and pick a jury or you're gonna have to settle the case or I'm gonna dismiss the case, right? <laughs> It's going to be disposed in some way. They're not really let a case get beyond standards and goals. Now, in the Bronx, they do. They, they don't really, you know, the Bronx, I don't know. There's no rules in the Bronx. So the Bronx, it could go like years beyond standards and goals. So that date date doesn't really mean anything there. So a lot of it is like knowing all the ins and outs, all the intricacies. But yeah, I mean, it sounds like, uh, you know, definitely. And another, another way you could research it is NYSEF. That's the N-Y-S-C-E-F, which is the New York State. I believe, I forgot what the C stands for, but it's electronic filing. So it's N-Y-S, New York State, C-E-F. So it's electronic filing. Like I said, I forgot what the C stands for, but that's what they call it, NYSEF. So you go into the NYSEF, and I think it's free. You could search as a guest, and you put in your name, and it should find your case, and it should have all the information there as well. But those are the two ways, e-law, meaning e-law.com. I think you could create a free account. I'm not sure. Uh, and also NYSEF. NYSEF, I'm pretty sure, is free. Uh, there's also like Web Civil Supreme, something like that. Web Civil Supreme, you could search that, and that's like the courts. I think it's called e track or e-courts, and that's free also. But that won't really tell you like where you are exactly. Like, no, I mean, only the courts know where you are exactly. Like, you know, are you 400th or the best way to tell is like by figuring out, um, you know, the standards and goals date. That's the best way. Okay, let's see what other questions. I probably have to run soon. Been, oh, we've been on for almost 40 minutes. Wow, the time flies. <laughs> time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, Gary, Gary Wilson. Oh, Enrique says, thank you. You are the best. Thank you, Enrique. That's awesome. Yeah, good luck to your, to your case. That's good that you won those two appeals. Gary says, I have a disc bulge and got the steroid injection, but after some months, I started to feel the same pain again. What can be my settlement value? I have 43 doctor visits and two MRIs, and what is the range of the settlement value? Yeah, like, you know, I don't really, like I said, settlement value is kind of hard for me to guess. It's really something you should ask your lawyer. But a disc bulge with steroid injections, um, steroid injections can be worth, I mean, the most I've ever gotten just for steroid injections without anything else was like about 150000 Settlement value, they go for much less. Just steroid injections settle for like 20000 30000 usually. They don't really go for too much. But if you try the case, if you take the case all the way and follow a lawsuit and fight it, it could be like a hundred. Or close to 100. Usually the percutaneous discectomies go for way more than the epidural, which is the steroids. The epidurals, they're so common, everyone's doing them and they don't really do anything. They just like numb the pain. It's like taking a Tylenol, but you're taking it for your back. You have the herniated disc. So you take a steroid and you have a steroid shot um, and then, you know, it, it numbs the area. So you still have the leak from the disc, the herniation, the disc is still leaking. It's still touching the nerve roots. It's still causing pain. But now it's just being numbed by that epidural medicine. Now the epidural is going to wear off. And when it wears off, the pain is just going to come back. So the steroid doesn't really solve anything. And the insurance companies don't really pay huge uh, numbers on it. Okay. And the Nature Boy channel says, 
can you do videos about manhole defects? Yeah, sure, manhole defects. Yeah, actually, that's a good topic. Uh, I'll do that. Because in New York, I believe when a manhole, there's a 12 inch rule. So the manhole has to be flush with the roadway. And there's that 12 inch rule. So 12 inch circumference, meaning around the manhole, 12 inches, one foot out, it has to be like straight with the manhole. It can't be like that the roadway is higher or that the manhole is higher, right? That would be a violation of that New York City code. But it only applies in New York City. So I had a case in Westchester. It doesn't apply in Westchester, but I still won the case. Um, I have to go and read the motion papers and there was an appeal. It wasn't an appeal in my case. It was an appeal in another case, but I had found the appeal and read it and used some of the same arguments that that appellate lawyer used. So it was a lot of like deep dive. It was a lot of work, but we won that case and we ended up settling it for I think 300 something thousand. It, but it was a manhole. Because a lot of the manhole cases, if you don't have that kind of notice and you don't have that kind of law or regulation like you have in Manhattan, they can get dismissed. So you have to make sure your lawyer knows about manholes. It's a little bit complicated. Okay, and Curry and Thompson Logistics, how much is a lumbar discectomy? Well, like again, like the whole point is like, you know, I don't think like specific procedure has a value, right? The whole thing is my whole, my whole, my whole message, my whole purpose is like really doing a deep dive and doing an individual consultation and like understanding your human story, right? How this particular incident affected you, how it affected your life, how it affected your ability to enjoy life, your pursuit of happiness. I mean, it'll be the medical records, right? That's one component of it, but also the lost wages, also the med future medicals, but it's the overall picture. So I couldn't just tell you what a procedure is worth, but just to tell you what I've settled those cases for myself. Yeah, like a lumbar discectomy, I've settled for like in Manhattan, I had a verdict of 548,000. I recently had two people, but they were out in Nassau. I think we got like 850 or 800 something for two people, which is very good in Nassau. That's a very conservative venue. Um, individually, I've settled discectomy cases anywhere. And I'm talking about percutaneous discectomies, which are like the injection. So it's more minimally invasive anywhere from like, let's say 150 as the low up to probably like five, 600 being the higher end is what I've settled them for. But remember each case is, indiv is, is an individual. So you can't really say what a procedure is worth. Okay. Okay, awesome. Yeah, it looks like that's about it. I don't see any other questions. So yeah, thank you for joining us. Like, please like and subscribe to our channel. Tell your friends to uh, view our channel, to uh, subscribe. I see we have almost 5,000 subscribers already. So that's awesome. I'm really happy that the channel has grown. When I started, I remember I just had like maybe 20, 30 subscribers a few years ago, and now it's almost 5,000 people. And I think on... Um, Google, I saw that we have almost like over 2 million views. So that's amazing that people are interested in this. And I'll try to do other topics that you're interested in. So the number one thing I could ask of you is please, um, you know, leave us like a comment about what you want to see. And we'll try to do that. We'll try to make a video to show you what you want to see, make interesting com uh, content for you. I might have to hire like some other video editors to make it a little bit more exciting. So it's not just always me talking. Maybe it's me, a little B-roll, a little lists, you know, like a little bit more entertaining. I want to make it entertaining for you. I want to do whatever I can for the viewer, but let us know what you'd like to see. Maybe some more shorts, some more lives. We'll keep doing the last week tonight. We'll do content videos. I have a few ideas. I was going to do a, some series on like depositions. Like somebody asked today, uh, a series about um, the lawsuit process, the series about how long it takes with the value. I know that's the number one question, right? How much am I going to get? Everyone wants to know how much money am I going to get? Uh, then maybe some series on traumatic brain injury, series on trucking uh, accidents, um, and then maybe different types of injuries, different types of niches or specifics within, within law. But yeah, let us know what you want to see. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night, and we will talk to you very soon. Okay, bye-bye.